What's the word, y'all? We're continuing our series of talking about all 30 NBA teams leading up to the 2024-2025 season. Yesterday, we dropped the video about the Knicks. If you missed that, go check it out. I, I read through the comments. Literally, everybody's talking about me cutting my hair. No, nobody had a single input about the Knicks. It was like, what happened to your hair, Kenny? Well, it's gone. Today, we got the Miami Heat, one of the more intriguing teams for me this offseason. And I bet you, like, Kenny... How, how are they so intriguing? They didn't do anything, um, but I'll explain. About a month or so ago uh, on the Numbers on the Board podcast, a podcast that I host, uh, we were talking about the Heat at large and, and trying to figure out if this still is a team that strikes a little bit of fear into their opponent's heart like they have over the last five seasons, or is this a team that should be looking towards a retool slash rebuild with Jimmy Butler getting older and not being able to stay healthy and him wanting a big old contract when Pat Riley talking like he did at his end of season press conference, what direction should this team go? What tier of a team should we think about them as? And if you go watch that podcast, I gave very uh, elementary responses to that because I didn't really have a real opinion about it. Well, over the last couple weeks since that podcast i've watched a lot of film i've looked through a lot of numbers and damn it i gotta take and we're gonna talk about it so last season the miami heat were a playing team again the previous year they were playing team to an nba finalist this year didn't have that same amount of luck slash talent and they got eliminated in the first round funny enough when i woke up this morning the first tweet that i was tagged in was this um, B-Ball Index has this thing where you can track NBA injuries and they sort teams that have dealt with the most amount of injuries based on LeBron. I don't really care about the LeBron stat necessarily, but instead I wanted to show this as far as games missed for individual teams. As you can see, the Miami Heat missed 313 games last season. And it wasn't like the 13th man on the roster. They were fifth in the league when it comes to their, their real rotational pieces missing minutes. And the Memphis Grizzlies went a whole nother level. They set a record for most games missed and most minutes missed and most everything missed. But the Miami Heat are far behind, but still pretty high on this list. So in the video, Kenny, um, if they're healthy, they're good. If, if they're not healthy, they're five games, 10 games over 500. But I honestly think it's a little bit deeper than that. Because while I do believe if this team is healthy, this is a team that could potentially be one of the top end seeds in the Eastern Conference, I still don't look at them as a team that is going to go on another legendary run, whether it be the 2020 bubble or the eighth seed to NBA finalists. I don't think that team, this team is as deep or has a high level offensive talent to go on that deep level run again. But when I look at this depth chart, I see a competent, good team. The, the real question is, will they stay healthy again? And it's basically been two seasons since we've seen a real complete healthy season for the Heat, which makes no sense. Usually, if a team has bad injury luck one year, the next year, they get the best. Or if it's, it's vice versa, right? You get the best injury luck one year, the next year, you fall off a little bit. This team had back-to-back -back years where, like, nobody was healthy. So the odds just say this should be should be a healthy season, right? Now, one of the reasons why I feel so confident in the Miami Heat being a good regular season team, even if I don't think they can win a championship this season, is because the defense is just on a whole nother level. I just showed you how many games they miss of their core people, um, how many minutes they miss of their core people, and yet they were still a top five defense in basketball. This team doesn't necessarily have a ton of hard-nosed defenders. You have Hayward Highsmith, who's really, really good. You have Jimmy Butler that has fallen off at least a little bit over the last couple of seasons, but when he locks in, he's still great. And then you have the most versatile defender in basketball. And I've said this about Bam Adebayo for the last couple of seasons, but going through the footage over the last two weeks, it's, it's unequivocally him. It's unequivocally him. He had been a guy throughout the course of his career to be a, a up at the, the attack type defender, a switch defender at the five position. That just opens up so much for your defense, right? I didn't even realize in real time that during the 2023-2024 season, he played more drop coverage than any time in his career. Over half of the pick and rolls that he defended, he was in drop coverage. And I remember one of the criticisms over the last couple of seasons about Bam Adebayo is that they bring him at the point of attack um, on these pick and rolls is because A, he's really good at it, but also he's just not as good of a rim protector as some of the other elite level defensive bigs in basketball. He shut all of it up this season. All of it. And that level of versatility from the center position is just something I appreciate a ton. You think about some of the other elite level defensive de uh, bigs across basketball, they traditionally are really good at one thing. Rudy Gobert is one of the best drop coverage bigs ever, right? You don't ask him to come to the point of attack. You don't ask him to come to the touch. But with Bam being able to do both, it like there, there was a game I watched when they played against, um, it, was, it was the Cavaliers where we saw Donovan Mitchell get the ball on a pick and roll where Bam came to the point of attack. And then the very next possession, it was Darius Garland and they played drop coverage and both ended in bad shot attempts. 
That, like that is the Bam Adebayo effect defensively. So I just trust what he does defensively along with, again, a Hayward Highsmith who's really, really good defensively and occasionally these other dudes um, being like solid team defenders like Duncan Robinson. I trust that so much more than maybe some other defensive schemes across basketball, especially if we can get another locked in Jimmy Butler season. Because last year, it was not that. Last year, I would argue, was one of his worst seasons as the Miami Heat. And if you look at the count of stats, it kind of tells you that. But when you watch and you're like, damn, Jimmy, we just going to sit around and let these other dudes dribble, dribble, dribble when you have the talent to be the guy. Now, I think that sometimes he is overtaxed, right, where in his mind, he can kind of coast through the regular season and he turned it up in the postseason. Well, this year he was injured and he couldn't even plan the postseason. So this feels like a completely lost season for Jimmy Butler. And that's why I believe that like Pat Riley and the dudes that are running the show haven't put that contract on the table just yet because they cannot be a team that's okay with being the playing team and think that they can just switch it on once we get to mid-April until the rest of the season. That's unrealistic. So the idea of them getting a real season from Jimmy Butler is important. Now the question is, is what we saw last season really just him coasting? Or is this the first sign of like real regression because it's inevitable for all of these players. Everybody's getting worse eventually. And Jimmy Butler is an older star in basketball. So is his a low assist rate and his lower usage rate because he's tired and dealing with injuries? Or is it just a first sign that he is going to the next part of his career? I don't really have the answer to that. If I was a better man, I would say that when he's healthy, we can get that version of him. But I want to show you some stats when it comes to Jimmy Butler and that usage rate. This is Jimmy Butler's game log from last season. He played 60 games. And um, I'm just going to do this. I counted it already for you. And, and this is, again, a 25% usage rate is still high, but it's not really high when you consider the amount of responsibilities Jimmy Butler normally has or him being the best player on this team. Last season, he had 31 games. Again, that's over half of his games where his usage rate was 25 or lower. And again, some of these games you get like a, a three-shot game from Jimmy Butler. Three shots, Jimmy? A four-shot game from Jimmy Butler. Over half of his games, his usage rate was pretty low for his standard. Just a few years back, while I would deem to be the best season of Jimmy Butler's uh, Miami career, it's it's just 15 of them. And some of these, it's like him playing 12 minutes. So yeah, his usage rate wasn't really high in those 12 minutes. He probably was dealing with some injury. I don't know the real story of um, November 10th, 2021. But he has just been way off the ball and way less engaged this season than he was previous years. And that's scary because this has been a team that hasn't been great offensively for some time. And you're trying to tell me one of our best offensive weapons, our best offensive weapon is not as involved as normal. Yes, our offense is going to tank. And part of that might be Jimmy Butler trying to allow some of the younger dudes to spread their wings and have Tyler Hero hit that next step or Jaime Hawkins as a rookie look really good and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, you want Jimmy Butler to be the version of him that, that he has been in previous years. And the offense, it's not good. If there's anything that would turn you off from the Miami Heat, it has to be the offense because it's just, it's not good. They don't get up a lot of three-pointers, which I think in 2024, it's, you have to do it. There's only a certain amount of teams, a small percentage of teams that can be bottom five and offensive three-point rate and still be really successful. And that team is basically the Denver Nuggets because they have the best player in the world. The Miami Heat can't expect to be a great team if they're not getting three-point shots up. But then you look at the roster, you're like, yeah, Jimmy Butler's never been a three-point shooter, even though he shot it at, what, a 40% clip on two and a half attempts this season one of his better three-point shooting years of his career if not the best on a low volume you have Tyler Hero who is a shot creator who we're going to get to in a second you have a Terry Rozier later in the season who's also a shot creator like they just don't have a ton of dudes that you expect to take a lot of threes it can't just be all Duncan Robinson right but if there's one thing to say about the Miami Heat they do a pretty good job of helping players evolve their game to the next level Duncan Robinson is a perfect example of this. Of course, he has the one season where he's phenomenal to catch and shoot that gets him that big old contract. He has the season after that where he's dreadful, where he's getting DMPs occasionally. And then he comes back and he has the ball in his hands and putting the ball on the floor more than any time in his career. And he's successful at it. And I think the next thing for this team is to figure that out for Tyler Hero. Tyler Hero is one of those players that had become a blind spot in my mind. He's one of the dudes I was super excited about after the first couple years of his career, 
But he has not got that much better over the last, let's say, two to three. Now, he only played 42 games last season, so maybe it's unfair to kind of uh, judge him on that season. But that's the sample size that we have, where there are things that he's been better at. Like his pick and roll, decision making, and ball handling has been better every single season. But there are other things about his game that have not evolved to the point where you wanted it to be or you expected it to be when you gave him that contract. I'm, maybe I'm crazy. I'm kind of a shot diet police. I can't lie to you. If you're going to be a high mid-range shooting, pull-up shooter, yada, 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 you got to be efficient at it. And Tyler Hero over the last couple seasons hasn't had that level of efficiency that you want with a player that's handling the ball that many times and taking those difficult shots. When it goes in, it's phenomenal. It looks amazing. But when it's not, it can be a hard watch. It's just for me, for me at least, just way too many pull-ups and way too many floaters. Now his floater game has got better throughout the course of his career. I'm not taking that away. I don't want him to completely get rid of floaters, but he's not putting the pressure on the rim. Pretty much nobody on the Heat put pressure on the rim at this point in their career, especially Jimmy Butler who fell off in that respect last season as well. This is a team that doesn't get to the rim at all. They settle for a damn and a bio mid-range jump shot, a Tyler Hero mid-range jump shot, a Jimmy Butler turn around mid-range jump shot. The only person that's getting the three-point looks is Duncan. And the only person getting to the rim is Jaime Hawkins. He's like the only one. He's the only one putting real pressure on the rim, and that has to change. I don't think everybody got to be a bulldozer and get to the rim all the time, but when you think about their rim rate, the frequency at the rim was 28.5, which is tied for 29th in basketball. The teams that he's they're tied with is the Dallas Mavericks, who were second in three-point rate. So like, yeah, we're going to shoot, shoot threes to get to the basket. I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, the Golden State Warriors were dead last, and then they were six in three-point attempts, while Miami is not getting to the rim or attempting a crazy amount of threes. They were they were middle of the pack when it came to three-point rate. But they they was first in that mid-range area. <laughs> they were number one. That's over the Phoenix Suns, and that's kind of impressive. So I, I think that if this team wants to get back to being contenders, a, a few things have to happen. Again, we need another really good Jimmy Butler season. You, Jimmy has to realize that the regular season has to be taken seriously, or he has to just be healthy. Him being the best version of himself is like the number one thing. But number two is that we need to change the shot diet at least a little bit for, for Tyler Hero because he's so great at catch and shoot. It is other, he is a 44% catch and shoot point three pointer guy. I don't know how we don't get him uh, taking those shots more often. It just doesn't happen. So I would love to see Tyler Hero's role not regress necessarily, but just get shifted a little bit. Just get shifted. And maybe that does happen because we really haven't seen that many minutes of Tyler Hero and Terry Rozier together or even any of their starting five. They played so little amount of minutes that it's hard to even say that, you know, maybe Tyler Hero is doing this out of necessity versus what he really is. I don't really know. And I know I'm all over the place, damn it. That's why you watch the channel. I don't really be having notes. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about for uh, the Miami Heat is to see Bam Adebayo at the four more. Um, we saw it in the Olympics, and Lord knows it looked amazing, whether it be in those scrimmage games or during the actual Olympics. I loved almost every single second I saw Bam Adebayo at the four. It was something that I've been asking for for quite a long time. And the last month of the season, Bam Adebayo increased his three-point rate. I don't know if he's finally going to actually shoot him, but if he's shooting the three-point shot at any clip and they run him at the four with uh, Kaleo Ware at all, again, I don't know how much min how many minutes he's going to get as a rook, I'm really, really intrigued on what their potential lineups can look like if Bam is at the four. Because one role that I want to see Bam in even more, and again, he's the, one of the, mo the most versatile defender of basketball, I would love to see him as a as a roamer for a long time, just to kind of see what that looks like. Give him the Jaron Jackson Jr. role or the Giannis role. Or they're, like Giannis is one of the best help defenders in all of basketball where you allow him to play free safety. Bam Adebayo has those instincts and that IQ defensively to do that to a high high level as well. So I'm just, I just want to see more of that now. If it's not Kelly Ware, they don't really have anybody else to really do that, right? They have Thomas Bryant on the roster and then Kevin Love. Kevin Love might size down to a four, even though he's a little bit slower than a traditional four in basketball nowadays. So the only real way we get Bam out of buyout the five is really him and the rookie Kelly Ware. And I just don't know how good Kelly is going to look, even though he looked really good in summer league. The next thing was a conversation about the starting lineup. Uh, because the depth chart, again, has this as their starting unit, Terry Rozier, Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler, Nikola Jovic, and Bam Adebayo. But a lot of people, at least that I know that are Heat fans, are hoping that Jaime Jaquez wins that battle. Um, and I understand that because, you know, Jaime Jaquez had a really good season as a rookie. I mean, I know he cooled down a little bit towards the back end of it, but he is a really good player. And he somewhat reminds me of Jimmy in a, in a way. I'll be honest with you. Um, but I kind of like the idea of Nikola Jovic starting and letting Jaime Jaquez be the first guy off the bench just because I look at that second unit of Alec Burks, Josh 
um, Josh Richardson, Duncan Robson. Like, I feel like they need um, a, a ball handler slash creator. And I think Jaime Jaquez can be that. I also saw a lot when I went through this footage of Nikola Jovic of opposing teams putting, I think I may have pulled some clips up. That Oh my God, did I have clips ready for this? Maybe I do, hold on. Opposing teams felt really good about having Nikola Jovic being guarded by a guard. Um, and I feel like with him having another year under his belt, he even talked about him getting a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger that, I mean, he took a three and he hit the three in the shot. But if he decides to put on a little bit more muscle and be a little bit more aggressive with his size, that can open up a whole nother element of the Miami Heat offense because, hey, I don't, I don't think you should be able to put a six foot four guard on me. I'm going to take advantage of that. So I, that's why I would rather have Nikola Jovic start, even though Jaime Hakez is the better overall player. And the last thing before we get to our recaps, if, if we can't somehow get Tyler Hero to change his shot diet or get Tyler Hero to hit that next level where he can take those same shots but be more efficient, it has to be important that they stay very active to try to get an apex level ball handler. I understood why they were really in on uh, Damian Lillard because he answers a lot of their offensive questions. A guy like Damian Lillard is probably not coming on the market anytime soon, but you need a guy like that, honestly. As currently constructed, I believe that the Miami Heat should be a really, really good um, regular season team as long as they're healthy, but I don't feel like I have the level of confidence to think that they can take that to the next level once they get to the postseason. Overall, I just kind of forgot how many decent and exciting slash intriguing younger players are on the Miami Heat, so I'm looking forward to that as well. You let me know in the comment section what you think about the Heat. Again, my apologies for being all over the place, but that's... That's what you get here. I don't know.